Okay, so perioperative nutrition, or does nutritional status even matter? Do we really care about the status of your nutritional state and you're going to surgery? And the answer is, yeah, we've known that actually since the 30s, uh, when the study by Studley looked at mortality in electrosurgery for peptic ulcer. And he saw that in patients who had less than 20% weight loss, mortality was only about 3.5%. And those who had greater than 20% weight loss, the mortality was 33%. Again, this is from the 30s. More recently, MegWid in adults showed similar kinds of findings. Mortality in abdominal surgery for malignant disease. If you're well-nursed, 4%. If you're malnourished, which included a weight loss of greater than 10%, that jumped dramatically all the way up to 23%. And here's the data from the original uh, 30 study from uh, Studley. So over here, yep. percentage of weight loss. And here are 28 cases, one death, uh, where the weight loss was under 20%, and then see what happens when it goes up here. Uh, 18 cases, six deaths. So your nutritional status before you go to surgery means quite a bit. And the same thing is true for kids. There have now been a couple studies that I've quoted here to show you. Uh, there's a two-year survival after liver transplant related to Z-weight score, so prior to transplant. So if your Z-score, remember everybody talked about Z-score already, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so if your Z-score uh, is less than one, uh, the two-year survival was only 57%, but if it was greater than one, minus one, then it was greater than 95%. Uh, another study, hospital stay and infection after cardiac surgery was also related to Z-score and serum albumin, respectively, understanding the caveats that were put forth earlier about uh, serum albumin. And a neurosurgical study also showed the same thing about surgery complications related to serum albumin. Again, taking the caveat of uh, how serum albumin might be affected by a number of factors. But if we look at the data from that study, this is the Glasgow Coma Score, uh, with the lower score being worse. And here's normally nourished in the open boxes and undernourished in the shaded uh, bars. And here you can see mortality. So again, even in pediatric data, which tell us that uh, your nutritional status going to surgery can significantly infect or impact your risk for uh, mortality and uh, morbidity. So it does matter if we actually do something about that then. Well, theoretically, you'd think that it should. Uh, so there has been a perioperative enteral, okay, this is enteral versus no treatment meta-analysis done by um, Ron Koritz from California. And what he's found was that there were fewer infections, with, so this is comparing enteral to no, no treatment at all. Fewer infections in patients who had enteral uh, treatment a tendency for fewer intra-abdominal and intrathoracic complications, but interestingly enough, no difference in mortality uh, and no difference in total major wound uh, complications. So that's enteral versus nothing. If we look at enteral versus parenteral, again, in, from uh, a couple different meta-analyses, overall the data would suggest that there are fewer infectious complications with enteral, uh, fewer major complications with enteral, fewer intra-abdominal, intra-thoracic complications, again, with enteral and a shorter hospitalization. So clearly, enteral feeding is much better than parenteral feeding uh, when it comes to perioperative nutrition. Uh, ESPGIN has released guidelines on enteral nutrition for surgical patients. Again, this is for adults. We don't have anything for kids. Uh, but they suggest that if uh, that it's indicated, that enteral in nutrition is indicated, uh, if it's, oops, sorry, wrong buttons. That's my jumpiness, Dan. Okay. okay, I'm fidgeting, yeah. Okay, it's likely, if it's likely that it's going to be inadequate for greater than 14 days or 7 to 10 days post-operative, then enteral nutrition is, is indicated. Or if it's going to be less than 60% of what's recommended, that is nutritional requirements, for greater than 10 days, it's indicated. And, of course, these things are pretty obvious how it would be contraindicated for enteral feedings. It's preoperatively pre indicated. Uh, if the weight loss is greater than 10 to 15 percent within six months before the surgery, uh, again in adults, the body mass index of less than 18 and a half uh, kilograms per meter squared, or the serum albumin, again taking that caveat of less than three grams, and it's not due to something that's obvious like liver disease or renal disease. But if you're going to do it, like I sort of implied with parental nutrition, you need to do it right, which means if you're not going to do seven to 10 days, it's probably not going to have much of a benefit and otherwise they would suggest it's not indicated. For parental nutrition, 
uh, basically sort of the same thing. If you can't do enteral, then you have to do parenteral. And similar findings for the weight loss, for the BMI, for the albumin. And again, if you're going to do it, you need to do it adequately for 7 to 10 days. And some data suggests there is improved postoperative outcome. Uh, for post-operative nutritional support, that's indicated if your patient is severely malnourished and unable to receive any enteral intake for greater than or equal to seven days. And of course, some enteral intake is preferable. So again, not a lot of this is actually based on hardcore, hardcore data, but implying what's from in the literature and from these other studies talking about morbidity and mortality associated with malnutrition, uh, these are what the recommendations are. Again, no firm, clear recommendations that we have for kids. But they certainly, I think, would, would apply for certainly children, at least. There has been one pediatric randomized trial of nutritional support vis-a-vis uh, -vis perioperatively, and this is from Marin, where he took 63 kids who had peritonitis due to perforated appendix. And was, they were randomized to parental nutrition uh, within 24 to 48 hours postoperatively, or a control group for five days, obviously a, a pretty short-term study. But the parental nutrition group did have better nitrogen balance than serum IGF-1. So again, if they'd carried this out, they may have shown more of a benefit or perhaps less of a benefit in terms of actual morbidity and so forth. Uh, but this is the best we have in pediatrics as far as I know. This is sort of an interesting uh, concept that uh, I learned about as I was uh, researching this topic. This is called enhanced recovery after surgery. And this was a group of surgeons who got together, adult surgeons, uh, in an effort to reduce hospital stay after colonic reception, resection for colon cancer. Uh, and so preoperatively, the, or what they did was they sat down and designed a schema where they thought they could get patients out of the hospital quicker. So preoperatively, uh, they would put an epidural catheter in for pain treatment. And then postoperatively, within 12, 0 to 24 hours, they would not use an agastric tube. Uh, they actually would try to get the patients to start drinking this oral protein drink. Of course, this surprise is out for us and now for them at, in those days. But within 24 to 48 hours, they'd actually encourage the patient to start an oral diet. And within 48 hours, the idea was to remove the catheter and actually discharge them home. And there have been a number of studies now that have actually looked at this protocol in patients who actually underwent the protocol. Uh, and now there are at least... Uh, a lot of studies that would actually back up that this actually works for these kinds of patients. Uh, one of the things that they do do preoperatively is they limit fasting to two hours for liquids and six hours uh, for solids. And the patients should receive a carbohydrate loading actually before they go into surgery. Uh, and there's evidence that this reduces postoperative insulin resistance, which is, uh, so can be significant. And it's not really clear how this seems to work, but it seems to be uh, beneficial uh, potentially reducing the inflammatory response actually from surgery itself. And evidence would suggest using this protocol that, that again, there's enhanced recovery uh, and a shorter hospitalization. And that's shown in this nice uh, study that was recently published in nearly 600 patients. So in the co control group, they fasted preoperatively and didn't get the uh, postoperative intake until they passed flight as sort of the traditional way to manage surgical patients. But in the IRIS group, uh, again, they underwent this protocol where they had the carbohydrate loading before surgery and no NG tube and basically started eating within 24 hours of drinking this protein drink. And they found they had less insulin resistance, lower serum cytokines, shorter hospital stay, 10% reduction in cost, and no difference in complications. And this matches, again, these other meta-analyses that were done on this protocol. So I think this is really sort of being begged to be done uh, in pediatric patients as well, and it sort of runs counter to whatever I would ever walk up to one of my surgeons and suggest doing with any of our pediatric patients. Uh, in terms of specialized nutritional supports, there are a few meta-analyses out there. For example, the use of fish oil or glutamine dipeptide given in parental nutrition. Some evidence that it does decrease length of stay and does potentially decrease risk of infection. Again, no pediatric studies uh, to my knowledge. And then immunonutrition, uh, we heard a little bit about, I think, a little bit earlier in terms of using arginine or and glutamine or mega fatty acids or nucleotides. And again, a little bit of evidence to suggest that they may reduce complications, infection, uh, or hospitalization, at least by a, a small amount. But again, more studies uh, need to be done on this, particularly in kids, because there aren't any, to my, to my knowledge. So in general, then, 
we assess uh, nutritional risk prior to surgery, decide whether the patients are mild or moderately malnourished or they're severely malnourished. If they are severely malnourished, then certainly some preoperative nutrition uh, is indicated. And again, the guideline would be somewhere between seven to 14 days, seven to 10 days the minimum, and ideally uh, enterally if you could do it. Uh, on the other side, if they're normally nourished, then what you do is just give them this oral carbohydrate drink, carbohydrate loading two hours prior to surgery, and then ideally, one would like to see whether this EROS model actually fits for other types of surgical uh, interventions. So I'm going to sort of spin the wheels on you here and talk about a pseudo uh, surgical case. And the reason I did this was because this could be a surgical case. I mean, really, sort of could be. And the second thing is, is as I looked over the the, uh, the topics that were going to be covered, this topic wasn't really sort of covered. And I and I thought this would be a good one to cover. And somebody actually came up to me this morning and said, oh, could you answer this question about this? And it turned out to be this was what I, was what I was going to talk about anyway. So I sort of felt vindicated talking about it. So this is a 12-year-old African-American male with familial parenchyotitis, presents 10 days of increasing abdominal pain, decreased appetite, physical examination, blood work, abdominal ultrasound, all consistent with parenchyotitis. And his usual hospital stay in the past has been uh, 7 to 10 days. So here's his growth chart. So here's his stature, and here's his weight. So don't need an MD degree to know what's going on there. So my polling question. So what would be the most appropriate percentage of the recommended daily allowance uh, for his energy intake? 50%, 75, 100, 125. Yeah, no brainer. Okay, that's, that was a giveaway question. Okay, what would be the most appropriate initial route for providing uh, nutrition? And so your choice is a peripheral TPN, a central TPN, a nasogastric tube with enteral feedings, or nasojejunal tube with enteral feedings. That's only four people. Oh, there you go. There you go. Kick butt. All right. 13, 14. Okay, so the data, whoa. <laughs> this is like politics. Okay, let's sit there. All right, so the data would support uh, enteral feeding uh, in pancreatitis, but what type of enteral feeding? Well, if it had been, is it still moving? It's fidgeting more than me. Uh, okay, so if we talked about this maybe like 10 years ago, the probable answer would have been uh, nasojejunal feedings. If you look at the experimental data from humans, actually, in terms of whether or not enteral feedings stimulate pancreatic secretion, the answer is the further down you put enteral feedings, the less they stimulate a pancreatic secretion. And the more elemental you use, the less you stimulate pancreatic secretions. But in reality now, uh, if you look at the data from more recent studies, uh, most patients with pancreatitis actually would do okay with just nasogastric feedings. Failing nasogastric feedings, nasogenual feedings would be the right thing to do. Okay, next question. So what would be the most appropriate enteral diet? So elemental, semi-elemental, or polymeric? And we're getting the reports now from Washington State as the polls close. <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah. That's where the Muslim president comes from, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oops, they're still jumping. Okay. So the numbers are still changing. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm glad everybody actually participating. That's wonderful. 
or it's like the stock market. Okay. Sorry, what was that? Okay, so again, if, if we look at the data that's out there, and from a clinical standpoint, actually, forgetting about the theoretical idea, in fact, most patients will do well on a polymeric diet. Uh, even though, again, as I said, there are data from human studies, uh, some published in the American Journal of Physiology uh, a few years back, uh, showing that semi-elemental or elemental diets will be less stimulatory to pancreatic function. In fact, most patients actually will do pretty well uh, on a polymeric diet. So again, you're sort of right, everybody's sort of right uh, with these, but I'd certainly start out with a polymeric diet, uh, and then if that failed, then consider using either semi-elemental or, or elemental diet in somebody with pancreatitis.